We are but participants in this worship, which Christ offers in our name to the Father through the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the gathering of God's people in this place. Let us excite one another to spirited worship as we recall all of God's blessings this past week. Let us stand and sing our intro, shout to the Lord. There we go. My Jesus, Lord, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, my days, I want to pray for the one of us. With the passing of the years, human memory grows dim. But our faith is that lives forgotten and lost to us are not lost to Almighty God. Today in worship, we are joining our remembrances with the eternal remembrance of God. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, and bless your name forever and ever. Every single day, we will bless you and praise your name. Your goodness is beyond our understanding. Each generation will praise your mighty acts and bear witness to them to the next generation. We will meditate on your glorious and wondrous works, O God. Wondrous works made visible through your justice and your kindness and experience in your nearness to all who call on you in truth and faith. As we cry out to you with sincere and humble hearts, you hear our prayers and you save us. With you, O oh God, and destruction, let our mouth speak words of praise and let all people bless God's holy name forever and ever. Let us sing together, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord. Worship His glory. 
Please be seated. We confess that we are a people unworthy to approach a holy God, but know that Christ is a high priest interceding to the Father for us. Let us confess our sins to God. Gracious and merciful God, we give thanks that you gave a whole new dimension to traditional faith when you entered the confusion and messiness of human life in person, in Jesus Christ. He communicated your divine love in ways which gave significance and purpose to people's lives. We mean to do likewise, but we hesitate and the moment is lost. We confess that all too often we fail to communicate our faith in ways which empower others. As we remember what you, O oh God, have done throughout history and in and through Jesus, we acknowledge that part of our task as a community of faith is the passing on of those memories in responsible and credible ways. We confess that we get so caught up with the pressures of the present that we forget how important these memories are for shaping our identity as people of faith, for shaping and reshaping our values, you demonstrated in Jesus that your care for us extends beyond time and space. We run out of time so easily and often, and often think about space, only in terms of having a quiet moment for ourselves. Forgive us when we find that we have no spare time to even think about caring for those outside our family or faith community. We need reminding again and again, O oh God, that you, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Strengthen us to be people of faith, people refreshed and empowered by your spirit. Remind us that despite our weaknesses and our failures, you are shaping and reshaping our lives in new and exciting ways. We pray therefore that the greatness of your love will be truly visible as we hold fast to the traditions we have been taught. And we pray that you, most merciful God, with our Lord Jesus Christ, will comfort our hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Amen. Assurance of forgiveness. Jesus surely brought to fruition the psalmist's prayer that all who cry out to God will be saved. Hold fast, therefore, to the teaching that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so I declare to you with confidence, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing our children's hymn, Jesus Stand Among Us. Thank you.
Connecting with all Reformed faith, the Presbyterian moment. Sin separates us from God. We confess that we are sinners. We do not care for the world as we should. We do not fulfill our calling to serve God. Our lives do not reflect the Creator's love. Our failure is sin, a rebellion against God, an insistence that we be God in our own lives. God has given us the law to show us how to live, yet we are unable to keep the Ten Commandments, and we do not love God without reserve, nor neighbor as ourselves. Above all, our sin is exposed by the perfect life of Christ. Let us say together our statement of faith. We are not alone. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and arisen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We eagerly listen for a word from you, Lord Jesus Christ, to help us in our daily life and to equip us for the mission to which you have called us. Or hymn of illumination, tell me the old, old story. Old old story, unseen things above of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. Tell me the story simply as to a little child. For
be seated. Our prayer of illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in you, in your will, discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. The Red Word, the Holy Scriptures. First reading from Haggai chapter 1, verses 15 to chapter 2, verse 9. The splendor of the second temple is prophesied. Good morning, everyone. We may be few this morning, but it's wonderful to be here to worship. On the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year that Darius was emperor, that sentence began in the, let me read it again. On the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year that Darius was emperor. On the 21st day of the seventh month of that same year, the Lord spoke again through the prophet Haggai. He told Haggai to speak to Jerubbabel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the high priest, and to the people, and to say to them, is there anyone among you who can still remember how splendid the temple used to be? How does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all, but now, don't be discouraged, any of you. Do the work, for I am with you. When you came out of Egypt, I promised that I would always be with you. I am still with you, so do not be afraid. Before long, I will shake heaven and earth, land and sea. I will overthrow all the nations, and their treasures will be brought here and the temple will be filled with wealth. All the silver and gold of the world is mine. The new temple will be more splendid than the old one, and there I will give my people prosperity and peace. The Lord Almighty has spoken. The word of the Lord. Verses 1 to 5 and 17 to 21. God's greatness and splendor is praised. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate in your wonderful works. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle reading from Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, 13 to 17. You will not be left behind on the day of the Lord. Being gathered together to be with him, I beg you, my friends, not to be so easily confused in your thinking or upset by the claim that the day of the Lord has come. Perhaps it is thought 
that we said this, that, that we said this while prophesying or preaching, or that we wrote it in a letter. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. For the day will, will not come until the final rebellion takes place and the wicked one appears, who is destined to hell. He will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Don't you remember? I told you all this while I was with you. We must thank God at all times for you, friends, you whom the Lord loves. For God chose you as the first to be saved by the Spirit's power, to make you his holy people and by your, and by your faith in the truth. God called you to this through the good news we preached to you. He called you to, to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, our friends, stand firm and hold on to those truths which we taught you, both in our preaching and in our letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and in his grace gave us unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say, what is good? The word of the Lord. We will sing Fairest Lord Jesus, the first verse early. This remains easy. Mm -hmm. Fairest Lord Jesus. Gospel reading taken from Luke chapter 20, verses 27 to 38. Sadducees questioned Jesus about the resurrection. This reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. Then some Sadducees who says that Jesus, sorry, I apologize. Then some Sadducees who say that people will not rise from the dead came to Jesus and said, teacher, Moses wrote this law for us. If a man dies and leaves a wife, but no children, that man's brother must marry the widow so that they can have children who will be considered the dead man children. Once there were seven brothers, the eldest got married and died without having children. Then the second one married the woman and then the third. The same things happened to all seven. They died without having children. Last of all, the woman died. I'm sorry, am I on the right? Yeah. Okay. Last of all, the woman died. No children. Last of all, the woman died now, and they, I'm sorry, they died without having children. Last of all, the woman died. Now, on the day when the dead rise to life, whose wife will she be? All seven of them had married her. Jesus answered, 
then the man and woman of this age marry, but the man and woman who are worthy to rise from death and live in the age to come will not then marry. They will be like angels and cannot die. They are the sons of God because they have risen from death. And Moses clearly proves that the dead are raised to life. In the passage about the burning bush, he spoke of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living and not the dead. For to him, all are alive. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe we have special music today. So I think we will continue with the sermon by John Miller. Thank you. I'm a very poor substitute for special music by Richard. <laughs> and I certainly won't try to sing. The first thing I do when preparing for a sermon The first thing I do when preparing for a sermon is to look at the Bible readings for the day. And normally my preference is to choose a gospel reading and take my theme from that. When I looked at today's gospel reading, I wasn't sure I wanted to go there. It looked akin to stepping into a minefield. So what other options did I have? Hi, guy. From Haggai, I took the phrase, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. Given that we are now in this beautiful sanctuary, I thought that phrase held some promise. I then move to the epistle reading, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, and this phrase sort of jumped out at me. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. If Paul had been living today, he could have added to by word of mouth or by letter with or by WhatsApp or by Twitter or by Facebook, etc. We're awash with comments on these spatial, various social platforms. And there could be a sermon in that, but with the airwaves full of the US midterm elections, the only unfortunate phrase that kept jumping to mind was fake news. And we all know who loves to use that phrase, and his name isn't Paul. So back to Luke and the Gospel reading. Actually, it wasn't a minefield at all, and there's little of anything to do with who was married to whom, or when they were married, or unmarried. This is about two things. Firstly, a slavish attachment to long outmoded traditions, that had little of any relevance to modern society or indeed the society that existed at the time of Jesus. And secondly, God is the God of the living, both of the life in the flesh and eternal life in the spirit. So who was questioning Jesus and what were the real motives in doing so? <clears throat> we often hear of Sadducees and Pharisees mentioned in the Bible, and they're often mentioned together. 
but in beliefs they had very little in common. The Pharisees were entirely a religious body. They had no political ambitions and were content with any government which allowed them to carry out the ceremonial law. The Sadducees were few, but very wealthy. The priests and the aristocrats were nearly all Sadducees. They were the governing class, and they were largely collaborationists with Rome, Rome being the colonial power. And they were collaborationists because they were un unwilling to lose their wealth, their comfort, and their place in society. The Pharisees accepted the scriptures, plus all the thousand detailed regulations and rules of the oral and ceremonial law. I have a friend who's an Orthodox Jew, and, and he sticks rigidly to this ceremonial law, no matter what he is doing. He's a busy businessman, but he will stop, and he will adhere to what his religion says he has to adhere to. The Sadducees accepted only the written law of the Old Testament, and even not the whole of the Old Testament, just the first seven books of the Old Testament. They stressed only the law of Moses and set no store on the prophetic books. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection from the dead and in angels and spirits. The Sadducees held that there was no resurrection from the dead and that there were no angels or spirits. The Pharisees believed in fate and that a man's life was planned and ordered by God. The Sadducees believed in unrestricted free will. That's unrestricted free will for them, not for anybody else. The Pharisees believed in and hoped for the coming of the Messiah, but clearly didn't accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Sadducees did not believe in the coming of the Messiah. For them, the coming of the Messiah would have been a disturbance of their carefully ordered lives, and consequently, any talk of it was something to be suppressed. Jesus was being questioned then by the Sadducees, who were steeped in tradition, were at odds with the views of the Pharisees, and who did not believe in the resurrection. Webster's Dictionary defines the word tradition as a, tradi as a transmission of knowledge, opinions, customs, doctrines, and practices from generation to generation, originally by word of mouth and personal example. We have all inherited traditions from our ancestors, which we'll in turn pass on to future generations, whether they're accepted or not. And traditions are important. The church also has traditions. The main highlights of the church's calendar are the traditional observances of Easter and Christmas. Many times in the church, if we do something more than once, it automatically becomes a tradition. For example, the order of service. That was something that was introduced a few years ago. We follow it and it has become one of our traditions. The time at which we hold our Sunday worship service. That's a tradition that was recently challenged and changed. The time that we hold our Christmas Day service. Shocking to some, we're not accustomed to it. How long or how short the sermon should be. We tend to the short. And I was thinking of tradition. <clears throat> if we go back to traditions in the Free Church of Scotland, they considered music in the church as an abomination. They did not have organs in their church. The only thing they sang were psalms on the company. That was their tradition. And I have to wonder, this organ was originally installed in this church 
about 150 years ago. Maybe not so much as that, but 120 years ago. It's older than that, but it was installed about 120 years ago. The church had been in existence for 70 years before that. What did we do for music? I don't know. It's not written down anywhere. I don't know what they did for music for those 70 years before we had the organ. Today, we have the organ. We have this organ. It's an old organ. We have the electronic organ. And we have no organist. So we're using pipe music. That's a change. Are we accepting the change happily? Or are we saying, no, I'm not going to church because Richard is not there playing the organ? We're comfortable with these traditions. <clears throat> They're part of who we are. And they help us to maintain some sense of balance in our lives. Tradition is a good thing, but even good things can be carried to the extreme. When honoring tradition is taken to the extreme, it can then become traditionalism. And like most other isms, traditionalism can be very harmful. Traditionalism, by def definition, is a system of faith founded on tradition, adherence to tradition, especially undue reference for tradition in religious matters. Sometimes because of traditionalism, we do what we do without really knowing why we do it. Why do we sing the hymns? Why do we have the psalms here? Why do we have the readings? So we know that's just the way. We've always done it. A dangerous practice at best and the cause of much internal strife in the church today, as much as it was in the synagogue 2,000 years ago. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were only two factions of the Jewish church. There were many others, and they were all at odds with each other. There's a tradition that plays out every week on Wednesday at midday when the British Parliament is sitting at Westminster. It's called Prime Minister's Questions. When, in theory, leaders of the opposition parties and selected individual members of parliament can ask questions of the prime minister. It's primarily a piece of political theater, which is neither illuminating in terms of the questions asked or the answers thereto. The point of the exercise is nothing to do with important matters of state, it is a purported to be. It's all about political point scoring against the protagonists and their parties and sound bites for the press. And most importantly for them, they get to do it on live TV. Each side enters the chamber with their minds already made up and firmly closed to any opposing view. So it is in the scripture reading for today. We find the Sadducees playing a point scoring game with Jesus to get an admission from him on which side of the issue he supports. <clears throat> the Sadducees then came with a question about who would be the husband in heaven of the woman who was married to seven different men. They regarded such a question as the kind of thing that made belief in the resurrection of the body ridiculous. Jesus gave them a simple answer, which is a permanently valid truth in it. He said that we must not think of heaven in terms of this earth. Life there will be quite different because we will be quite different. Let me just say that again. We must not think of heaven in terms of this earth. Life there will be quite different because we will be quite different. Perhaps we might all be a little more content with this life if we cease to speculate on what heaven is like and left things to God. Jesus went further. We know that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the body. They declared they could not believe in it because there was no information about it, 
still less any proof of it in the books of the law, which Moses was held to have written. So far, no rabbi had been able to meet them on that ground, but Jesus did. He pointed out that Moses himself had heard God say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and that it was impossible that God should be the God of the dead. Therefore, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob must be still alive. Therefore, there was such a thing as the resurrection of the body. The scribes declared it to be a good answer, for Jesus had met the Sadducees on their own ground and defeated them. One for Jesus against the Sadducees. The Sadducees had tied themselves up in their own traditionalist web, those closed minds focused on one part of the Bible, and as far as they were concerned, nothing happened after that. So let's go back to tradition for a moment, because it does have its place in the scheme of things. Paul, in his letter of encouragement to the struggling young church of Thessalonica, and just let's think of Paul's letters for a moment. This was not a manual for running a church. What we are seeing in Paul's letters is one side of a conversation. He was answering letters that came from these churches. We haven't seen those letters. What we have seen are just the answers. And in fact, his letters follow in terms of form and how they're laid out and perhaps not content, but certainly how things are expressed was in effect a template that was in practice at that time. And we know that because papyrus letters have survived, written by Roman soldiers, back to the family and so on, which, form, which follow the same format as Paul's letters. So we've only seen one side of that conversation, so bear that in mind. We didn't hear what the questions were. We've only seen the answers. He said, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions we taught you, either by word of mouth or by our letters. And tradition is important, but tradition must leave room for revelation. Because the spirit blows where it wills, and it's not something that we can control. And that's always been a problem in the church, and I talk about the church in general, not specifically this church alone, from the very beginning to today. We don't seem to want to leave any room for revelation when we're talking about tradition. Jesus was at odds with the Sadducees and the Pharisees because he was at odds with the traditions of the church and introducing new ideas, new revelations. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. But the Catholic Church did not like the new ideas that he was presenting. And he was excommunicated from the church. And that was the beginning of the reform movement of which our church form now forms a part. It has been said that any church that is alive lives on the edge of heresy. And that's certainly what they thought about Jesus and what they thought about Martin Luther, that they were heretics. But in terms of a church that's, that is alive, it means that its members won't refuse new ideas or new programs or new challenges simply because there are those in the church who say, we never did it that way before and want these to be the final words on the subject matter. These have been called the seven last words of the church, and in many cases, they have been. We have a new sanctuary. In a few weeks, we will formally open it to the whole of Grenada. We have new movements within the church to revive the ministry to the youth, to the young adults, to the greater community. 
It's a new beginning for us. So let's go back to Haggai for a minute. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. The present house, the former house, most of it is now a car park. But that makes it possible for us to come to the present house. The glory of this present house will only be so if we make it so. By all means, remember our history, because it has often been said that those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. And I take that to mean repeat the mistakes. Think of history for a minute. The Sadducees have disappeared in the sands of time. They no longer exist. But have their ideas disappeared? Aren't they very, very much alive in the society we're living in today? The people of wealth and power the pursuit of wealth and power because that gives control over the lives of other people. The thought that free will is for us, the rulers, not for you, the rules. We will give you the rules. You will follow our rules. If we make mistakes, you will suffer for our mistakes. We will not suffer. The Sadducees may be gone, but their ideas are still here. So it's a battle that Jesus fought. It's a battle that we need to fight from within this church. This church needs to be alive and open to new ideas and open to revelations because it is a battle that we have to fight from within the church. No one else is going to do it. By all means, preserve the traditions that are meaningful and provide stability in an uncertain world, but be open to new ideas and the making of new traditions that will signal to everybody out there that we are part of a living and vibrant church. We don't just have a new sanctuary. The people within the sanctuary must also demonstrate that we have a new approach to life and living and the community that we live in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. We respond with thanksgiving through commitment of ourselves and giving of tithes and offerings. Let us sing our hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
Please be seated as we present our offerings. Gracious God, receive and bless these gifts, we pray. We offer them in response to the great gift of yourself, revealed in Jesus, and the precious gift of faith, carefully handed, handed down through the power of your Holy Spirit from one generation to another. May this offering and the offering of our lives truly witness to our dedication to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, sharing and passing on, our, passing on our faith through word and deed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. 
We take our prayers to the Father who is always willing to hear us through Christ, our high priest and mediator in the power of the Holy Spirit or an over and back. Do we have church family updates today? Sorry, John. Okay, we we have uh, Faye has a birthday this week coming up, so we'll who then? Crystal has a birthday this week as well. Uh, do we have any other celebrations this week or anything else? No. Okay, so let's sing Happy Birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Okay, so let us pray. We thank you, dear God, for your amazing power and work in our lives. We thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. We thank you that you are able to bring hope, even though we are in the toughest of times. Strengthen us for your purposes. We thank you for your grace, love and care, for your mercy and grace. We thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. We thank you for your sacrifice so that we might have freedom and, and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are and for all that you do and for all that you have given. Help us to set our eyes on our hearts, on you afresh. Renew our spirits. Fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. We thank you, God, for the benefits thou has bestowed upon our church and our nation. We thank you for our minister and his family in a very special way. And for all the other ministers who have graciously served us in the past. For our foundation members, who have worked tirelessly to serve you and to, have, to bring us to where we are today. We thank you for John and for our technical team this morning who, are providing, who have provided us with a message, a very a powerful message and for our music as well. Look up to our preparations for our, our look over our preparations for official opening on November 27, as we seek to glorify your name. Dear God, inspire the young members of our church and our nation to want to build and rebuild your kingdom. Walk with them on this journey. As we begin this week, give us praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. And let us sing together the prayer that you have taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver.
have any testimonials to share today from anyone? We go having heard your word to us to make a difference in our communities and the world. Let us sing our hymn of sending forth, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Embraced by the genuine love of Jesus Christ, held fast by the unfailing strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If through the fellowship, the liturgy, the hymns, the reading of scripture, the special music or the sermon God has spoken to you, and you desire to make a profession of faith, recommitment of life, become a member of this congregation, make a pledge or just a talk, please contact the minister or your elder to arrange an appointment. Our announcements, so a youth meeting on the fourth Saturday of every month, the Women's Guild meeting on the third Monday of each month at 4.45. The Scots Kirk Young Adults, Skya, will be having a planning meeting on the second Sunday in November that's next week, the 13th at 5 p.m. Young adults' role in the service on December 4th will be discussed. All young adults, 17 to 25, are invited to attend. Bible study is in recess until November 10th. Um, I think that is put off for an, an, an additional week because Reverend James uh, is unavailable. Uh, choir practice, Wednesday. It will be here at the Kirk at 4.30. Dr. James will be on vacation October 26th. Um, well, this says November 9th, but he has extended to next Sunday, November 13th. Uh, Dr. James has been working tirelessly on his vacation and he really needs a rest. 
So he is on vacation until next Sunday, the 13th. Do we have any other comments? Good morning again. Um, I just wanted to let you know that a luncheon for the indigents is being planned for the week of, during our week of activities of the formal opening of the cook. We are catering for 40 persons. And I would just like to share with you the, some of the ingredients needed. So persons who are willing to sponsor and support, you are not obligated, but if you feel that you want to contribute to this event, please feel free to contact me or other members of the guild. Um, we need a bag of mixed vegetables, three coconuts, a case of chicken, 20 pounds rice, two large bags of carrots, six medium cabbages and seasoning. So uh, if you feel you want to give any of these items or give towards any of these items, or you want to contribute things like um, snack box, not snack boxes, the food boxes and napkins, all donations are welcome. This is going to be happening the week of the 27th to the 4th, and the luncheon is going to be held in the latter part of that week. Okay, right here at the cook. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Any other announcements? Okay, if not, let's sing our recessional. We are his hands. We are his 
Know yourself, made in the image of God, and may the peace of God be with you always, and also with you. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Peace.